Hello, everyone. I'm David, part of the Australian Student Christian Movement. We have a special guest with us. Can you please tell us who you are? Yeah, hi, I'm JD, JD Bauman. Excellent. Now, we have a tradition in Australia that we acknowledge the lands on which we meet and acknowledge our elders past, present and emerging. So I just want to do that. And also you're joining us from the US, so sort of want to acknowledge uh, the Native Americans. You are part of EA for Christians. Can you tell us what that is, or Christians for EA? Sure, yeah. Uh, we are a community of Christians in the global effective altruism movement. Effective altruism, real short, is uh, it's an idea and it's a movement. The idea is to use reason and evidence to do good better. And there's this movement of, um, of people around the world, uh, including in Australia, who care quite a lot about this idea, are applying it to charity, how to give well, how to give effectively using reason and evidence applying it to careers, how we can discern callings that really have an impact, that evidence shows um, has an impact on pressing global problems like climate change, like poverty, uh, and are trying to support each other in a global movement, not just silo ourselves and try to change the world on our own, but be a part of a broader community and movement that is trying to impact the world effectively together. Can you tell us some of the issues that sort of EI would focus on? Yeah, there's quite a few of them. So the obvious ones are global poverty, uh, you know, the fact that 600 million people or so live on under about $2 a day. Uh, it's quite a lot of people. Uh, easily preventable or treatable diseases uh, like malaria or schistosomiasis, as well as uh, other areas that we're familiar with, climate change, uh, animal welfare is a large one, uh, but also maybe more novel risks so risks from artificial intelligence going the wrong way, impacting culture in the wrong direction, or potentially leading to a catastrophe if uh, misaligned AI uh, goes the wrong directions, or other um, what we call existential risks like uh, pandemics that maybe are so powerful that they can severely, uh, severely impact the world, maybe kill millions, potentially uh, more people uh, if, if we see bioengineered ones or, or even nuclear weapons going the wrong way. So uh, effective altruism is, as we say, cause neutral. You can be in this movement and you can engage with this movement regardless of what cause you focus on. But the causes that people in effective altruism care about are as a rule, very important causes. They affect a lot of people and uh, in very dramatic ways. Uh, they are neglected. These are causes that relative to their importance don't get a lot of attention, don't get a lot of time or money relative to their scale. Uh, and they're also tractable. There are causes that we can actually move the needle on. Uh, and so effective altruism is really keen to find what are those ways that we can move the needle in each of these causes uh, with our careers, with our donations and so forth. In the religious space, can you kind of highlight some of the international development relief agencies that you come across? Yeah, absolutely. So some of the largest development agencies are religious. So. And it's no surprise, right? In Matthew 25, Jesus uh, commands us to care for the least of these, and he identifies himself with the poor. So rightly so, Christians have, uh, throughout time, um, sought to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And today, um, some of the largest development organizations, World Vision, Compassion International, um, these are multi-billion dollar uh, Christian organizations. Um, there are many others. Hope is one that comes to mind. Um, yes, those are all US-based ones. I'm sure there are some based in Australia. What comes to mind when you, when you think of that? Well, you stole my first one, which is World Vision. We, we have that um, too as well. And then of course, there's different, um, like Caritas, Anglican Overseas Aid, um, Anglican Aid Abroad. We've got a lot of Anglican ones coming up um, and, and things like that and Anglican Board of Mission. So they're certainly uh, out there. Can I ask you a bit more about the theology. So you mentioned Matthew, about that kind of is a, is a framework for Christians. Why should Christians care about malaria or poverty or people on the other side of the world? So I think it's uncontroversial that we ought to love others as ourselves. You know, Christ gave us, this is the greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Um, it, it, it seems uncontroversial that somebody's premature death by a tropical disease, take malaria, for instance, which kills about 400,000 people every year, 
Um, it seems uncontroversial that that is a bad thing that we want to prevent that. Um, and Jesus himself didn't only meet people's spiritual needs. We see Jesus healing people. We see Jesus sometimes healing people um, and telling them to go and be well. Um, I, it's obvious Jesus cares about people's souls, but he cares about their bodies as well. Christianity is not a disembodied religion. Um, we care about all of the people that Christ loves, um, especially the poor, especially the marginalized. You do see that principle throughout scripture that Jesus says, blessed are the poor, blessed are the, blessed are the weak. Um, I think there's a particular Christian emphasis on those who are particularly neglected. So uh, I can't get away. I can't escape that. Right. I, I wouldn't know what it means to be a Christian if it didn't involve helping the poor in some way. At least I couldn't read scripture and not find that. I think Sojourners has this great collection of over 2000 verses that talk about helping the poor and the neglected. Um, that's, yeah. <laughs> and we've that's had people in the health space, you know, say Jesus came not just to give us life, but that it would be in abundance. So for them, that means that we want to improve people's health. And I was thinking of another uh, group, the Lutherans and their international development agency, and they, their interpretation of the commandments, things like thou shall not steal. They go one step further and say, that doesn't mean just don't steal from people. It also means protect what they have, build what they have, their income. And it's it's not just the negative, it's reinfor yeah, reinforcing yeah. the positive as well. Yes. Yeah, and, uh, correct. And they also have it with, you know, thou shall not kill. They say, well, it's not just about not killing people. It's also protecting people's lives, keeping them safe. And that justifies their international development uh, work. Uh, and I feel bad because I only mentioned some uh, mostly Anglican ones before, so now I need to mention some others like uh, the Lutherans and you know Baptist World Aid. When it comes to the idea of effective, non-effective, can you give us examples of so what's what's effective, an effective intervention and a non-effective intervention? Sure, because I mean otherwise we're just here talking about doing good, which is a good thing to talk about, right? But um, I think the unique angle that effective altruism has is this implication in the name itself that we want our altruism to be effective. And that kind of implies that not all altruism is effective. Some altruism actually harms people. Um, and as a Christian, you know, I grew up reading this book called When Helping Hurts, which is by someone by Brian Fickert. Um, I'm not sure if you're David familiar, familiar with that title, but um, the premise is that sometimes at least um, in his book, he outlines examples where Christian missionaries came into a place um, and thought they were making things better uh, but the world is a very complicated place, and sometimes even our best intentions don't actually help the poor. We can hurt them in many different ways. I won't go into the details, but um, we, we're all familiar with the Tom's Shoes example. Uh, we're all familiar with examples of um, people uh, imposing maybe harmful aspects of their culture on other people. Um, we know in the, in the poverty space, there's a lot of easy ways we can hurt people by messing up markets. Um, I'm thinking not just about directly harmful charities, but I'm also thinking about charities that are, um, are that are good, that are that are doing good work, but are maybe maybe just average, right? Um, that's, I guess, technically speaking, most charities you're going to find are just average charities. I mean, it's a good thing to give to charity. What effective altruism tries to do is it tries to find outstanding opportunities of really effective charities to give to. Um, I'll, I'll tell you kind of a story that gives an example of this. So there's this UK based charity um, called Guide Dogs and their focus is to equip people with um, seeing disabilities with seeing eye dogs who can help them navigate the streets of London. And um, it's really cool. You know, if I had a seeing disability I think I would want a guide dog. Um, guide Dogs website, they say it costs about $65,000 to train a seeing eye dog. Um, so there's that. Also throughout the world right now, there are thousands of people suffering from something called trachoma, which is this issue where your eyelid will grow inwards and it will scratch the surface of your cornea. And if you leave this untreated, in many cases, it causes you to go blind. The thing is, we know how to treat this. It costs about 40 to $50 to do a trachoma surgery. Uh, and there are charities right now who are trying to do this, who don't have enough money to do enough trachoma surgeries for the number of people who need them. So for the cost of providing one seeing eye dog for someone in the UK, you can provide trachoma surgeries for about three, 500 plus people um, in Sub-Saharan Africa. 
if you want to help the blind to see, you know, you can arguably do a lot more good in one path than the other. And so effective altruism isn't trying to tell you what to do. It's just trying to say, hey, we do see this massive disparity between average charities and the best charities. And as Christians, we should be really excited about the best ways to help others. I, I should caveat this. Effective altruism isn't necessarily a Christian movement. Um, I think the ethic is essentially Christian, though um, the movement itself is, um, it's, it, 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 it's, it's not explicitly Christian or unchristian. It's a secular movement. I run the Christian sub-community. Thank you for that um, example. So when it comes to effectiveness in charity, you said it, it's likely that a lot of charities are sort of just, they're, they're doing good, but not as much good as they could. Why is that? Are they, are they, do they not have the ability to uh, improve? Is it not on their radar? Is good enough good enough? What's the kind of reasoning why more charities aren't doing the best they can do? Is it resourcing? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think, um, I think it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a technical reason. So there's this really interesting experiment that some scientists did um, a few years ago where they where they, um, this, I believe this was after the oil spill in the Gulf and there were lots of birds that got caught up in the water and were stuck in oil. Um, and there's this big cleanup effort to try to get the oil out of the birds' feathers and so forth. And so um, people were, scientists administered this survey to people where they were asked, they were shown a picture of like 20 birds and they were asked like, how much would you be willing to spend to save these 20 birds? And people said something like, oh, um, like, like sixty dollars, and they said okay, and they sh <laughs> and they and they show them this visualization of two hundred thousand birds, and they said okay, how much would you be willing to spend to save two hundred thousand birds from oil? And the uh, survey taker said something like, hmm, like sixty five dollars. So people are willing to pay a little bit more to help like a thousand times more beings. Um, and the point isn't the the point is not like. Um, people don't know how to value the lives of birds. So people are broken. I mean, the point is that people have like very limited sense of attention. Um, when we can't visualize the number of people in a group in front of us, we don't actually know how to extend our empathy to that group. Um, and so once we're talking, you know, you've heard this, this, this mantra, like the death of one person is a tragedy. The death of a million is a statistic. That goes with our altruism too. When we try to help people, the extent to which we can make ourselves excited about altruism that helps a million people. It's just, it's just, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, it, it's scope insensitive is actually the technical word for this. We are insensitive to the scope of our ability to help. And I think sadly many charities are, I mean, if you look at how charities market themselves, um, they don't market themselves as, oh, we help the most people for, for your, your Australian dollar, your, your British pound. Um, they market themselves by telling a story. They show a story of an individual or two people who are in need, who need your help, who need your donations. Um, and then they take that money and then they use it to further a program. Um, but they're many times very well aware that, um, that um, what gets people to donate, what gets people really emotional in the moment is actually not what helps most people in the long run. So, so that's what I was gonna ask you. Is it one of these things where the charities are responding to where the public is? Or if the charities change their approach, the public would, would go along with that? That's a really good question. You know, I've thought about that a lot. Um, and charities are making improvements on this. So a couple of examples of ways charities could improve on this. One, they could be more transparent about their data. Most charities don't actually share exactly um, how many people they're helping, how they're gathering information about how they help. Um, this information is really important to actually know what a charity is doing. Um, there's been a lot of improvements there with charity navigators and other kind of watchdogs and societal forces that are kind of helping it to, um, I, I think it's both in. I think charities want to be encouraged to be transparent, but they're just large bureaucratic messes sometimes. And they also need the help of outside watchdogs to encourage them, to put pressure on them um, to do that. So to be more transparent, to actually use high, high quality evidence. So not just measuring what happens before we do our program or our, our charitable intervention, and then what happens after and seeing like what changes there, um, but actually doing like rigorous evidence, having a control group, um, doing a thing called an RCT, which is where you have a random control group uh, and you measure that, having partnerships with academic researchers to actually see what works and what doesn't. Um, 
also benchmarking towards other programs that we do no work. So actually having like a standard for your, your type of charity. Um, in poverty, we actually know that giving cash, like straight up cash works really, really well. Um, the chief economist of the United States aid agency um, is really in favor of, of this. Uh, and there've been over 72 very, very um, high powered studies that have shown that cash transfers are broadly very effective at helping the extreme poor, just giving them money. And it helps in so many ways in, in so many things we care about. So, you know, charities should be more transparent, should um, be use better evidence and should like reference to cash and other high quality programs in their areas. Um, Unfortunately, like uh, the broader public isn't aware of these issues so much. So I think a lot of charities are, are kind of, e even people within these charities are kind of waiting for the public to catch up on what effective charity looks like. Um, and, and I think groups like GiveWell and other, other um, evaluators are kind of leading the charge in showing us what that could look like and getting donors excited to only give to effective charities. So yeah, it's actually a really good question. So I don't know if that really answered it. No, but I think, it was, it was right answer. You know, and organizations are really complicated things, right? It's not just like one person at World Vision. World Vision has a board and a CEO who have a considerable amount of power, but they also have um, thousands and thousands of staff and then millions of, probably hundreds of thousands of donors, right? Across the world. So it's hard to balance all those interests to really focus on what's effective. When most people are giving you know, modest amounts of money, maybe a few dozen or a few hundred, a few hundred dollars, um, and don't want to do all this intense research. Yeah, and then you have that risk of, yeah, do you spend the money on the research or do you sort support something that you think is working or is probably working? When it comes to evidence, do we, is, is it agreed what works and what doesn't? Or is it a situation where it's like, well, you know, you say that's effective, but we, don't actually think it's effective or we're using a different uh, framework. Uh, is there, because we know obviously in the religious space and you know, there's debates over what does right. that verse mean? How do we interpret that? Will you interpret it that way? You interpret it that way. With research, is it clear cut? We know this works, we know it doesn't work or does it just sort of vary depending on how, what lens you're using? Yeah, that's a really good question. It depends on the, the space of charity that we're interested in. So if we're talking about poverty, we have a good sense of what program, what kinds of programs um, work in the poverty space. Um, and we know what it looks like to improve people's income. Um, sometimes it's hard to measure in a very, very technical way, like how much income increases. But this is the kind of technicality that economists um, are very interested in. And most of us realize that like, once you go from you know, um, two dollars a day income to three dollars a day income. It doesn't measure exact. It doesn't matter exactly if it's like three dollars twenty or two dollars ninety. You see a ma you see a pretty massive increase in income. Um, by and large, the disagreement that exists in the economic space is not so massive, and there is a lot of consensus about what actually works in in um, in in the anti poverty space, as well as I mean in the health space. There's a bit more controversy. Um, there's controversy about what does it mean to improve a life, especially the life of someone who's sick. How do you make comparisons between different kinds of sicknesses? So for instance, um, let's say I am suffering from blindness. You know, I have trachoma and, um, and I'm slowly losing my sight, my vision. How do we compare helping someone like me who has trachoma with somebody else who, um, who has parasitic worms in their stomach, which produces diarrhea and like reduces their concentration in school. And how, how do you make comparisons between those two? We have, we have methods. Um, some, just to mention a few, um, include like D-A-L-Y, dollies, or Q-A-L-Y, qualies. And these are ways that um, public health experts are trying to make comparisons. Um, and you might not like how these comparisons are made, but I think most people, including most people in effective altruism, think they're like pretty good starting points. Um, because what you can do is ask people, like, would you rather, um, would you rather live with um, less vision or would you rather live with parasitic worms? And you can ask people who've experienced both and you can get a sense by polling enough people what's actually much worse, right? We wouldn't compare a hangnail to cancer, right? Like one is just much worse than the other. We can get to some rough approximation of how these things weigh up against each other. Um, 
And then you talk about animals and other cause areas like animal cruelty space or other cause areas. And then it gets really hard, right? Like how do we compare the suffering of, um, of a chicken in a cage on a factory farm with a cow um, that is maybe being, you know, maybe it's a dairy cow, maybe it's being over milked. Um, how do we compare like the suffering and the life of those two beings? It's really hard. So um, yeah, I think that's a really hard question. And usually there's no clear cut answers. Yeah. Now you mentioned health. Malaria is one of the areas that get focused. Can you tell us what that focus looks like? What are the interventions against something like malaria? Sure. So, you know, malaria, a huge problem. There are about 400,000 people who die every year from malaria. We know how to solve it. Um, to solve malaria, um, we need to distribute more uh, insecticide treated malaria nets, which people put over their beds when they sleep. Um, there's other things you can do. There's a new exciting malaria vaccine that's coming out. Um, there are ways that we can treat local bodies of water to, uh, for malaria. But anyways, that's um, for the most part, the most cost-effective way to treat malaria is to purchase um, insecticide-treated malaria nets. And there are groups that do this and who distribute this over large areas. One very famous one is called the Against Malaria Foundation. And for about $5, um, that's what it costs to purchase and distribute one bed net. And on average, you need to purchase about, um, you need to purchase, a, I think it's about 900 bed nets or about $4,500 worth USD in order to buy enough bed nets to actually save somebody's life from malaria. Because that's running so, on the assumption that not everyone who's going to use the net would have got malaria, would have died from it or, or use it. So that's why you need that. That's right. That, I mean, that, that, in the right. average case, like what you're doing is, um, it, the real picture is much more complicated. So what you're doing is you're, you're providing an organization like Against Malaria Foundation to buy all these nets and also to train people to distribute them um, and then to measure the effectiveness of these distribution efforts. The people who receive these nets, some of them are going to throw them away. Some of them are going to use them as fishing nets. That's fine. Um, I mean, it's not what they're made to do, but that's fine. Um, we've measured that. We understand that. Um, and then use as directed. Be it, well, I would say that again. Use as directed. Using it as a fishing net. Yeah, that's right. Net, that's yeah. right. Um, and they are taught how to use the nets, right? So it's not like we just drop off the nets and we say, "Hey, good luck with that." Um, no, people are taught how to use malaria nets, um, and and. So you might think that the average person who uses this net might not get malaria at all. I actually don't know the incidence rate well enough. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if the average person who uses the net otherwise wouldn't get malaria, even if they didn't use the net. But the problem is there are still so many people who die of malaria, um, a sizable percentage of the population will get malaria in their lifetime. And if you get malaria, um, there's a good chance that you could die. Um, and so the better way to do this is just stop people from getting malaria in the first place. But some malaria nets, you know, um, it won't actually save somebody's life from death. It'll just save somebody from having a bad case of malaria, you know, and nobody wants a bad case of malaria. So all of this, if you factor in all the harms from malaria and all the lives lost, including all the like sicknesses that people have that are associated with being sick from malaria for a time, and you add that all up, it averages out to about $4,500, saves a life from malaria. And the idea is that most people get bitten while they're sleeping, hence the reason why the bed nets a kind of an effective tool. Oh yeah, yeah, exactly. Sorry, I, um, that's right. So malaria is a, mosqui a mosquito-borne illness. That's right. And you talk about, you know, how many lives can be saved or that it's a good intervention. There's obviously a trust issue that people have with all sorts of institutions and charities. If people say, look, I just don't believe what you said. I just, how do I know that's true? How do I know those nets are going to, you know, reach the people that are going to work? How do I know what you're saying is correct? What's your response to that? I think that's great. I think people should be very skeptical about whether charity works. I'm very skeptical about whether charity works. That's why we need transparent charities. That's why we need charities like Against Malaria Foundation, where they actually publish every year um, how many nets they purchased, how they distributed them, where those distribution sites are. You could physically go to those distribution sites and see if the nets are being used. So I think Unfortunately, a lot of charities have incentives to distort their numbers and manipulate their data. Unfortunately, that just is the world we're in. And um, many people don't even care about impact, quite sadly. Um, if you're a data skeptic, then you should look at GiveWell. They have, this is um, a charity evaluator for um, potentially like very outstanding giving opportunities, 
especially in the poverty and health space. And they have, they do about tens of thousands of hours of research um, into what works. And they have massive spreadsheets where they show you the raw data from these collection sites. Um, so just, yeah, we definitely encourage somebody to trust something like GiveWell. I mean, if you, if you look through it and you're not convinced, I'm not sure what will convince you. Um, some people will be skeptical. So here's, here's a deeper question. What do you do if somebody's like skeptical of that or they're skeptical of all institutional um, giving or, or they're just much more certain of their local causes? And I think that kind of giver, somebody who isn't willing to trust, um, who isn't willing to trust at all, I think that person is going to have a difficult time making an impact in the global giving space. Um, because we live in a global world and the best ways to give aren't to give locally right now for the poverty and health space. The fact is most people who are living in massively um, underprivileged conditions aren't living in your backyard in Australia or in the United States. Um, I read a stat recently that said that the lowest 15% of the population in India is actually wealthier than, the, than someone who's living at the upper 80th percentile. Um, in India, so, sorry, the so lowest 15% in the United States is wealthier than the 80th percentile of income in India. Mm -hmm. And so th that means if you wanna help the poorest people like, like Jesus did, frankly, you have to go to India, I mean, you, have to, you have to serve. That is one thing you could do. You could physically go to these places and see what these charities are doing. Um, I think that might be what many of us have to do to get excited enough, um, so. We had someone from Sri Lanka that talked to us and he said to me, nice. David, David, what you, view as kind of normal and basic in your life is a luxury for us. Mm. So there was that, you know, that huge contrast. Now we talked about poverty before and you talked about cash uh, transfers. Can you give us some ideas of the other interventions or a bit more about cash transfers when it comes to crime and poverty? Sure, sure. So um, with poverty, a big one is cash transfers. So by a cash transfer, we just mean sending people money, sending people who are living in extreme poverty under $2.20 a day, um, money, and not massive amounts of money, but you'll send a family of four, maybe a father, mother, and two children um, who are living all together um, on a few hundred dollars a year. You might send them $150. You'll send it to their mobile phone. Um, and throughout Sub-Saharan Africa right now, we, we have very good ways of sending money to people's mobile phones. That's kind of a new, a new thing. Um, you used to not be able to do that. That's why we're doing this now. Um, and people will use this money in all kinds of ways um, and not in ways you'd expect. So some people use this money to buy more livestock. Other people use this money to buy a motorcycle that they need to get into town for work um, or to buy a tin roof for their, for their hut because they sleep in a thatched roof hut. And when the rainy season comes, the rain leaks through the, the ceiling of your hut. And what this does, you know, what this does is it kind of like, it kind of democratizes the charity sector because all of a sudden we went from giving things that we thought people wanted, shoes or medicine or, um, or blankets and giving them cash so that we can empower them to buy for themselves what they actually want. And so it, it kind of, it, it really takes out the paternalism of giving. And I think um, it's, it's just really exciting actually. Um, Give Directly is an organization that you can give to to do this. Um, the, the founder in, of Give Directly, um, uh, Paul Niehaus, he's a Christian. His faith motivates him to start Give Directly and to do what he does. Um, and yeah, it's basically become a new normal for um, how we benchmark effectiveness in anti-poverty. So that's like one really exciting method. There's a couple other things people do. They have these graduation approaches where you might... Um, you might couple cash transfers with um, with educational classes about how to how to build wealth, how to steward wealth and build it well. Um, that works quite well um, in the anti-poverty space. Those probably work best, um, along with cash transfers in the health space. Some other effective interventions are besides trachoma surgeries and um, malaria nets. You have tablets like vitamin tablets for specific diseases. Vitamin A tablets are really good for, um, for, for, um, for several different things. Uh, and you have deworming tablets, which people will take. They cost about a dollar for a treatment. Um, children will take this in places like rural Kenya. And if they take a deworming tablet, then they'll be protected against parasitic worms in their stomachs, which, um, like I mentioned, cause all sorts of nastiness there. Um, 
And yeah, these are just some of the most effective ways to uh, make an impact in the health and poverty space. And we talked a bit before about some people just aren't going to be convinced that, you know, I don't trust anything. I'm not going to give. When it comes to getting people to give generally, especially sort of religious people, why do you think, and I'm sure there's more than one reason, of course, why do you think Christians in particular don't always give, given the, the theology behind it, why you should give, love your neighbour, why do you think it's um, hard to get them to give? We had someone from Uniting World, which is the Uniting uh, Church International Development Agency, you know, saying that we don't want this just to be viewed as a, we, this is charity off to the side. We want it to be, you know, this is part of that overall way that we help people, that we're Christian, that we do some good in the world. So it can't just be, oh, yeah, Uniting World's doing our, our charity for us so we don't have to do it, but wanted it to be a, a, yeah, even a broader yeah. way. Yeah, yeah. I think, so I think we don't give because, and I, I have a bit of a, I have a bit of a traditional view here. I think we don't give because we're all deeply broken. I, the, the classical Christian language for this is we're all sinful, right? We're, we're self-centered, we're egotistical, we're prideful. We see this in scripture, we see this in our own lives, right? Like I buy, I buy the cappuccino when I could I, I, I'd be fine with the tea or something much less expensive. I, I take vacations I don't need. I spend much more than I need to. I mean, I have a tremendous amount to grow in in my own life. And when I look at other people, I see that, you know, not only am I not giving as much as I could, but other people aren't giving as much as they can. And I think there's something inherent in us, which is just much too, um, much too, con much too consumed with our own desires and, um, and what we think we need to make us happy. But I think when we read scripture, we realize that um, Christ reminds us that sufficient for the day is its own troubles. And, um, and that when we, when we trust him, um, that we actually, he knows our needs, right? He says that, look at the sparrows, right? Um, or look at the lilies, right? They don't, they don't work, they don't toil or reap, and yet God cares for them. How much more will your heavenly father care for you um, he says that to us. And I think we just have a very difficult time believing that not just Christians. I mean, people in general, on average, whether Christian or unchristian give somewhere between one and 3% of our income a year. So, um, yeah, I think that's just, I think that's just how we feel. And, you know, there's, I think, I, I think the thing is though, we could all be giving more and it wouldn't actually make us less happy. I think it would make us more happy, right? Like if we, if we realized that we could give like at least 10% of our income, many of us could. Um, and that would save one or two people's lives every single year. I mean, that, that would be, we, we, we could save dozens, potentially hundreds of people over our lifetime who would have died from malaria. I mean, that's, that's a beautiful legacy. Um, and I think that that can expi inspire us to be super excited about giving. And it, it inspires me, right? Like my wife and I, we, um, um, we're, 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 we're trying, we're trying to do that. We're trying to give, um, we're trying to give much more than the average person, um, and, in many ways we fail, we, you know, we don't give nearly as much as we can, but um, it's a really joyful journey. And do you stay motivated or do you just go, there's a lot of issues out there, drop in the bucket, I'm out of it. I think you have to join communities of people who are really enforcing this habit of life, right? That's kind of what effective altruism is trying to do in many ways. It's trying to create it more normal, like more of a social norm around giving larger amounts of money away and giving it well. Um, I talk in my Bible studies about how important generosity is to Jesus and how important it is for the poor um, and how important it is we do that well. And I think sometimes it falls on deaf ears because I live in a very wealthy city and um, people will leave their Bible study and will walk out on the street and see somebody driving a Porsche 911 right away. And it's like, oh yeah, I want that, right? Like, um, and it's just normal, right? Like it's, we live in a world where Christians can drive Porsches and that's not a weird thing. Um, you know, the culture needs to change. And I think to motivate ourselves, we, we need to be a part of cultures that, um, that, that reinforce effective giving and radical generosity. The Porsche comment is funny to me because I attended a talk at a Lutheran college for the 500 years of the Reformation. And it was at a private school. And the fellow giving the talk kept saying, you know, if you were a real Christian, you wouldn't have an expensive BMW. And I thought, geez, he's half the people in the audience probably got there in the BMW and he kept saying that, you know, you, you, you don't need it. It's treasures. It's, you should be giving to those in need. And I thought, okay, so he, he pushed that. 
Can you talk a little bit more about your personal faith? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, what, what you said, yeah, also reminded me of this line I heard from a very conservative theologian in the US, John Piper. I think he, he has this one line, it's like, no one ever said, um, God is most glorified because you chose to drive a BMW. And I think, yeah, I, I think that's absolutely true. I think at the same time, you know, nobody ever said I need to, you know, no, nobody ever like looked at the amount of lives they could save and like looked at a BMW and said like, I would, I would let those people die in order to buy a BMW. And I think most people are just like blind to the world we live in where that choice is the choice we face every day when we're facing an expensive decision or an option to serve the poor. Um, we can't escape it, right? So, and they have yeah, that book. I, I, Sorry, just, just before you go on, it just also reminded me of the, the book, The Power yeah, of the yeah. Half. Do you know the, the book, The Power of the Half? Where No, um, I, I don't. So there was a, a, a young girl in a car and she saw a homeless person and then saw someone with an expensive car nearby and said to her dad, you know, if that person in that expensive car bought a slightly cheaper car, they could have given the difference to this homeless person. And the dad said, okay, well, that's all good and well, but what are you going to give up? And then they ended up as a family selling the house so they could buy right. a cheaper house and give half of the sale price to helping uh, people in need. And so they talk about the power of half. And, but just that idea of that's what triggered yeah, that, wow. that contrast. But sorry, yeah, about your personal faith. No, I, I'll, I'll check that out afterwards. I like that a lot. Um... And, you know, if, if we gave up half of our money, uh, half of our worth, our wealth in Australia, in the U.S., we would still be in like the top 90th percentile of richest people on Earth. If you look back in history, we'd probably still be in like the top 99th percentile. We'd be like the top 1% of global wealth of people who've ever lived. Um, Do you think there's a so, pushback from Christians on this? I remember hearing a, a sermon once about... You know, you can't serve two masters, God and wealth. And then their interpretation was, but that doesn't mean you can't have an expensive car or a big house. And, you know, some are like, well, actually, I think that's what it means. Do you think yes, it's within yeah. Christianity there is support for this idea of not buying a BMW or a Porsche or that Christians are like, no, no, it's just as long as you don't love the money, you can have lots of it. Yeah, yeah. they're like, it's the love. It's the love of mammon that is the root of all sin. It's not mammon itself. But then I remember what Jesus said about where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so if your treasure is in your house and your treasure is in your BMW and your treasure is in your retirement, well, then your heart is in all those things too, right? But Jesus tells us to have our heart with him. <laughs> um, give your heart, really. And then also, I mean, what's more to say, right? I think I think we all know that's... that's uh, it was pretty clear. I'm, I'm hesitant to say that because everyone says, well, that's your interpretation. But let's just say there's a lot in there about never turn someone away, love your neighbor as yourself, you can't have two masters. So there's certainly a, a lot in there that would, would emphasize helping to give liberally to the poor. But he certainly was pretty direct with that and asked for more than just a little bit. But sorry, more about your personal faith. Yeah. I never let yeah, you get yeah. to it. Yeah, sure, sure. Um... Sure. I will say just one last thing on that thing. I think Christians, we often more get caught up in what we perceive as our duty towards our family and our, and our kids and our spouse. And we think, oh, I need to save to provide for them. And, and we should, right? And there, are, there are passages in scripture that talk about the importance of caring for your spouse and for your family. I think there's one passage in the New Testament letters, it might have been Paul, um, where it says something like, he who doesn't provide for his own family is worse than an unbeliever, right? I mean, um, so, you know, there, there, there are these um, commands to care for your, for your own family. I think while that's true, there is also these commands to care for the poor. And I, I, I don't see the conflict there, right? Like, you know, most of us, you know, our, our kids have what they need. Most of us have homes that provide but we don't need to flesh out more we need to serve the poor so it's funny you say that um, and i know that people are like david just let the man talk about his personal faith but we keep getting reminded of different, th different things but the thing about family over stranger there is a charity foundation uh, in an asian uh, country where the person who founded that said one big issue is 
that the tradition is you leave your money to your family, which means, you know, less for charity. So he views his charity foundation as his third son. He says, I view mm. it as that is my third son. That is my family as well. And mm. therefore, mm. that's how you get around the cultural idea of, well, just focus on your family. So, but that is my family as well. Those people mm. are my mm. family as well. Mm. And in Christianity, we have this idea that the church is our family as well, the family of God. And so when we're serving, so Christians have different views about whether whether the poor belong to God's family or not, or whether we're still supposed to help them, even if they're not in God's family or whatnot. Um, I don't want to get in the weeds of that, though. But even in the most conservative interpretations, where only professing Christians belong to the family of God and where Christians are called to help them first, we still have this clear command to care for the poor within the church. And many of the recipients of the most effective charity programs right now are Christians. You look at rural Kenya, you look at people who are dying of malaria. Um, the, most of these people are Christians. Most of Kenya is, is a Christian country. And there are Christians around the world who will die of malaria if you and I don't donate more to Against Malaria Foundation, for instance, right? So that's just as scriptural, if not more scriptural than providing you know, extra needs for our own family. So. Um, that's what I thought of. Yeah, my own family, speaking of which, was um, a missionary family. My father was with um, Wycliffe Bible Translators for like 25 years, and my parents met on missions. So I grew up, um, you know, I grew up in a, in a special family where um, we were on support. So everything we had um, was, was donated to us. My dad didn't have a salary during his time in missions. And um, yeah, I, th I think that just like reminded me that you know everything we have belongs to god and i would either one day grow up to be a missionary myself or um give money to missionaries and i realized it doesn't just have to be about missions you know like serving christ in this world isn't just about um spreading the news of the gospel it's also sp spreading the kingdom of god indeed um serving the poor um helping also um, animals who are treated cruelly and helping these other cause areas that um, I believe God wants us to care about. So, but I am personally an Anglican. Um, I, um, I, uh, yeah, grew up um, Presbyterian. I um, was baptized in the Anglican church a few years ago. Um, my wife and I attend each week. Um, yeah. And how do you find that experience going to church, the Bible studies? What's your kind of experience? doing that anything stand yeah, out yeah yeah I, I i think there is like this uh i think it's 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 beautiful i think uh my faith grounds me and i think in college i i went to a christian college which is maybe different from the kind of university where you're um serving at now but um at my college everybody was was um christian everybody went to church more or less a very unusual thing i guess in the 21st century um so I was a bit of an outlier in trying to encourage my Christian friends to um, to uh, think about um, advancing the kingdom of God, not just in in, in word, but in deed. I I think I think the, like some of the messaging about radical generosity and um, also impactful careers, also like planning your career around where you could have the biggest impact um, for the poor. I think this is an idea that um, was a bit challenging for some. Um, yeah. Now, you mentioned sort of helping uh, animals, reducing animal cruelty. Can you give us some ideas on what that looks like? What are some of the interventions? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let me just sketch out the problem a bit. There are every year um, about billions of animals that we raise and kill in factory farms. Um, the farms that we have nowadays are post-industrial they are not your happy family farms that you see on the cover of um, your milk cartons. Uh, these, are, these are factories that we, for the most part, um, mass produce animals through. Um, animals are often treated as, not as like, as beings that we're called to steward, but as um, commodities. I used to find this all very sensational, right? Like I, I used to eat factory farm meat and like, um, I used to think like discussions about this were like kind of crazy. I thought it was like PETA types who care about this. Um, and um, I actually went vegetarian for Christian reasons, but then I later learned about factory farming. Um, anyways, 
we know how to address the suffering that happens in these farms. Um, there are a few ways. One way is to just provide better conditions for the animals suffering on these farms. Uh, for instance, chickens, chickens uh, that lay eggs, they are kept in battery cages. Um, so battery cages are so small that an average chicken, I have a sheet of paper here, um, it's a good demonstration. So like a, a battery cage for a chicken is about, um, is about 10 inches by like eight or 10 inches. I don't know if that is in, in Australia, do you, do you use inches? You're asking me tough questions. Yes, we do, we do use inches. <laughs> okay, okay, so, um, so you know, imagine this is like a square um, and that, that's roughly how a chicken spends its entire life when it's laying eggs. Um, in cages. In most cage, most chickens in the U.S. that are laying eggs are in cages. We're talking about hundreds of millions of chickens. Um, so one way to help these chickens is to um, encourage the food producers that produce these eggs to give them more space. So instead of having this much space, you give them about this much space. You give them like free range room so that chickens can do what they naturally want to do. They can spread their wings, they can clean their feathers, they can um, walk around a bit. And um, you can encourage um, through what's called corporate campaigns, you can encourage factories to um, commit to going cage-free by a certain date. Say by 2030, we want company X to go 100% cage-free. And then if they decide not to, then you can essentially blast them on social media for, um, for dishonoring their commitment. Um, that's the best way uh, that we know of right now to uh, reliably improve animal welfare. There are other ways that are pretty cool and promising. Um, happy to talk about those, but yeah, for the most part, it's mostly cultural and, 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 and pressure campaigns. Now you mentioned that the reason you became a vegetarian originally is because of your Christian faith. Can you go into that a bit more? Why did your Christian faith push you towards vegetarianism? Yeah, yeah, and I, I, I so I, to, to be clear, I don't think all Christians should go vegetarian or need to go vegetarian. I mean, I think it would be great, but um, I don't think scripture commands everybody to go vegetarian. I mean, you, you don't see it black and white in scripture, um, but um, you look at, you look at Eden, you look at Genesis, it's pretty clear there wasn't any killing or eating of animals in the garden. It wasn't until Genesis 9 that the first animal is killed, and that's only an accommodation. God does that to provide clothing. Um, you look at the new heavens and the new earth. You look at the eschaton passages of Isaiah. You have this image of the lion or the wolf laying with the lamb, um, of the cobra on the child's lap. Um, you have peace between animals and between humans. You look at Revelations. You read that there'll be no more suffering, no more death in the new creation. So with that, you have this you have this arc, this story arc in scripture of the perfect Eden that we're coming from and the perfect eschaton that we're going towards. And I think a big part of what Jesus came to do here was to proclaim the kingdom of God for that perfect eschaton, that the kingdom is coming, but not yet, right? Like that we, we will one day be in a perfect world in heaven, in new creation, and we're called to bring that here and now. Um, and to me, that just means bringing about peace, bringing about um, nonviolence between um, each other, but also with creation. And that to me just screams vegetarianism. Um, so that, that's why I went vegetarian. I didn't think animals were being tortured. I didn't think animals were suffering on factory farms. They are, um, so. And we know that some Christians do say that we should care about the planet and animals because of things like you know, in Genesis and about how we have dominion over them, but that doesn't mean in enslave them, it means care for them. And I know that some of our friends in the Seventh-day Adventist movement say, you know, Genesis said God gave us you know, seeds to eat uh, and we should look after our, our body, our, our temple, um, and that includes, you know, healthy eating and, and things like that. With doing more good or getting people to do more good, it, in religion, so this thing about you know tithing or do religious people on average give more than non-religious people, and if they do, why? Do you have a perspective on that? Whether religious people give more than non-religious? Yeah, and, and things like tithing, because there's always these debates about, well, no, the tithing, that doesn't apply to us anymore, and, and some faith groups do it, and then when it comes to, yeah, do religious people give more, and others will say, well, that's not true, or yes, but that's a, because it's forced. You kind of go to church, there's a plate, so you're not necessarily more charitable. Yeah. yeah. 
So I think, yeah, I think if you look at nominally religious people, I don't think it's the case that religious people give that much more than non-religious people. It's about the same. I mean, it's almost nothing for most people. Um, the tithe is interesting. So, so with the tithe, you have different views on this. So I think most Christians um, think there's like a weak commandment to tithe, that it was strongly commanded in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, you have the new covenant. And so tithing is no longer bound um, to us. And yet it's still a good thing to do to promote the church. And so we give 10% to, to, to the church, many people. Um, I don't know anybody who thinks that the, I know a handful of people who think it's like a firm duty. Um, but then, you know, you have these instances where, um, where you might think that like to do the most good, you don't only give to your local church, you should give globally, right? I mean, you have instances in the New Testament where Paul, for instance, had a financial collection for the church in Jerusalem. Um, you have New Testament precedents for that. And today you have many Christians who give to international NGOs. So um, I'm not sure if that answers the question, but no, I, I think the tithe is a really effective message though, and a really effective practice. You have non-Christian groups like Giving What We Can, uh, which have essentially a 10% giving pledge to, in their case, the most effective charities that you believe in. Um, and so I've taken that pledge. Um, it's sort of a modern day tithe. Um, so I, I think that's something that many of us, including everyone watching this, should consider doing. Take a pledge to give 10% of your income uh, over your lifetime to what you think are the most effective charities. And that might be Christian charities. Um, but that might also be secular charities giving out malaria nets, for instance. Thank you so much for joining us and talking about this. It was wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you want to learn more, you can go to eaforchristians.org. Um, we're also working on a, a site for students who are trying to discern a career with a real and radical impact um, to change the world. Uh, and that's christiansforimpact.org.